questions haunt every life, writes Andy Crouch. The first, what are we meant to be? And the second, why are we so far from what we're meant to be? Hello and welcome to Restoring the Soul, a podcast dedicated to helping you close the gap from what you're meant to be and what keeps you from being all that. I'm your producer, Brian Beatty. Thank you for listening to Restoring the Soul. This podcast is one of the most important we've ever produced. COVID-19, also known as the coronavirus, is not just an infectious disease. It's the source of what defines the current reality of much of the world. Fear, anxiety, and uncertainty are affecting millions, and people are coming to grips with what life is like in quarantine. Here at Restoring the Soul, we don't think the lasting effects of coronavirus is all gloom and doom. In fact, much of the beauty that will be seen after this passes will be found in the discovery of the true self, the need for community and connection, and that we are best when we're not alone. Michael's guest on this podcast is Dr. Kurt Thompson, a psychiatrist inspired by deep compassion for others. He's motivated by developing more authentic relationships and fully experiencing our deepest longing to be known. Michael was inspired by a recent blog post written by Dr. Thompson about COVID-19 titled Love and Lament in March Madness. We encourage you to read it today. You can find it on his site, KurtThompsonMD.com. Again, that's KurtThompsonMD.com. So without any further delay, here's your host, Michael John Cusick. Dr. Kurt Thompson, welcome back to the Restoring the Soul podcast. My friend, Michael, it's a pleasure to be here, as always. You know what's cool about this conversation is when you were on the program about two and a half years ago, um, which was a rich conversation, we had never met face to face. Uh, Mm -hmm. And since then, uh, you've become a dear friend uh, from a Mm -hmm. distance, but we got to spend a fair amount of time together, and it's really a treat to see your face and now have that connection. Mm -hmm. Man, right back at you. I I hope and I trust that the listeners will find this to be um, helpful and meaningful, but, you know, uh, not even selfishly, I'm just so tickled to be able to look at you and talk to you for an hour. I mean, I think this is, it's just a great joy. I'm so... Thank you for inviting me to be part of this. It's just, it's been really, it was great to be part of the um, uh, Restoring the Soul weekend back six months ago and uh, what a moving time that was and just really great to be back in your presence, even if virtually. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. Um, We, we often will text or talk a couple times a month. Uh, You're there in the DC area and I'm in Colorado, but I got your blog from our mutual Mm -hmm. friend, Kyle. And I devoured it, um, and it was about the strange, scary, turbulent, uh, unprecedented times that we're living in with COVID nineteen. And your second or third sentence in that paragraph of that of that blog uh, about March Madness playing on the uh, NCAA basketball tournaments that are canceled, <laughs> and all of how this is exacerbated in March. That line that stood out was. Um, none of what's happening catches the Trinity off guard. Can mm-hmm. you just comment on that and and unpack what you meant? Well, I'm, um, you know, I'm I, many years ago when Paul Young uh, wrote uh, in the shack, and his character Mac was having a conversation with Jesus, and I was struck by I, I'm perhaps going to hack this up and not an exact quote, but Jesus says to Mac, you know, one of the problems with you humans is that when you think about your future, you don't see me in it. And I, it struck me, that, that thought, that this notion that I don't really believe, I, I, think, I think God is uh, just as caught off guard, just as unhinged, just as anxious as I am about everything that's happening. And I think it is, uh, it's difficult for me to actually live in the world as Jesus admonished when he said, and this applies to so many things, unless you become like little children, you can't receive the kingdom of heaven. And one of the ways that children behave around their parents is that they do trust their parents, uh, that they trust their parents aren't going to be anxious about things. 
they look to their parents, you know, as we talk an awful lot about attachment. And one of the ways that, you know, attachment works is that when I'm afraid, I, as a child, I look to my parent. And when I see my parent being confident, uh, but kind and attentive in that moment, um, that helps me regulate when I'm looking at a parent who's not anxious about what I'm in the middle of, and perhaps even what we're both in the middle of. And I think uh, it's, it's hard for us, uh, that I, as I think I also said in the article, one of the things that strikes me about this virus is that it isn't just creating anxiety, it's revealing anxiety. It's revealing this undercurrent of how uh, I don't really, uh, there are times when I really don't trust that God is a parent uh, who's not anxious. I think he is. But I, I think it's important for us to be speaking to each other and reminding each other we who are followers of Jesus, you know, pointing each other to the king and uh, pointing each other to that picture of Jesus asleep in the boat on the Sea of Galilee that was, you know, you know, at war with itself. And those disciples of whom I am one, right, I'm, I'm the one who's talking to Jesus and say, like, what's your problem? Like, why aren't you doing something about this? Um, and th there's a it, it, there's a, a lot of work that I have to do because my anxiety is being revealed as much as it's being created by this phenomenon. Yeah, I just want to echo that because it's so easy to be on a podcast and be the expert who is above and beyond the struggle that we're talking about. But my anxiety is significant, <laughs> and I have been surprised by the level of compulsiveness in me in relation mm -hmm. to scrolling through my smartphone and downloading five new uh, news apps and just needing to be in the know and which right. creates this illusion of of being in control so thanks for yeah. alluding to your own anxiety kurt you are uh, a physician and a practicing psychiatrist what are you seeing in the people that you're working with individually and in groups for how this is affecting people well i think you know, what I'm going to say, I think our listeners won't be surprised at, hopefully what they will hear, though, is that uh, their experience is common. Their experience is, is normal. I think one thing that we would see is, uh, it's an odd thing, I think, is that, of course, there are so many people who, I mean, there are different levels of this distress. My wife is a clinical social worker, works in Arlington County Public Schools, and is well aware of a number of families who, uh, whose jobs just went away. And these, many of whom are living paycheck to paycheck in our community. And for them, uh, you know, there's no safety net. And so people are scrambling to find ways to answer the question, what will we be as the church for these people in that space? So there's one way in which I know that people are anxious because can they pay their rent? Can they put food on their table? Um, another way that people are anxious, I think, is, uh, of course, the, the worry that, you know, yes, we're in, uh, you know, shelter in place in Virginia, at least here until the 10th of June. But they're wondering, you know, will their jobs continue to extend? We, you know, we live in the national capital area. And so in some respects, it's a bit skewed because there are a lot of jobs that are protected by virtue of the federal government being here. But there's a lot of contractors here that are now not able to do a certain kind of work. And so people, though they have work now, they wonder, will they have work later on? And, and so there's, there's all those, those kinds of things where people are worried about their futures. But there's another way in which people's anxiety, I think, is being elevated. And that is um, with our having to be at home, with our being less mobile, with our having to be with the same people all the time, uh, not just anxiety, worry about things, but a certain sense of irritability that starts to show up for people, a certain sense of, I mean, this might not be the most effective way to say it, but a certain sense of boredom, a certain sense of I'm looking at the same four walls of my house. Yes, I do get out and go for a walk, but I come right back to the same place. And for many of our listeners, they may not yet be in that space where we are in uh, D.C. or where people are in New York or some other of the major cities. But I think that there is this sense in which people, um, you know, have to, you know, in this isolated place are now 
more confined to fewer people. And, you know, you, you find, gosh, my life actually does depend, a certain richness of my life depends upon having lots of interaction with different kinds of people. And to just be with my spouse, of, of course, all that would be lovely, theoretically. But to just be with my kids, parents who are now having to homeschool, when that was not what they signed up to do. Um, all those kinds of things, I think, raise not just the level of anxiety and worry, but, but I suppose one way that we could describe that would be people get to places where they start to feel overwhelmed with having to do the extra level of work that is required of them. Many people whose jobs are fine, but now all their work is done online and the extra interest, like literally neurobiological energy that is required to be on Zoom screens for anywhere from four to eight hours a day you know, has, has made things more difficult. You know, I, I think then the last thing I would say is that, you know, we, we, we've seen this happen. I, I personally, I was wondering, would people want to be doing psychotherapy work? Uh, who, who people who've been doing this in person, would they want to do this online? Would they want to do this virtually? I thought, well, maybe they wouldn't want to do that because it's just not going to work for them. And I have been struck by the degree of gratitude that people have had at being able to have contact and to talk about the nature of their life and to talk about how this feels so different and so challenging and so forth. And I think it brings us right back to this sense that um, anxiety for people is really at the end of the day so much more about disconnection. It's so much more about abandonment. It's so much more about, um, am I, are, are, are you still going to want to be with me, despite the fact that we've done nothing but the same thing for the last 14 days in a row, and we each find ourselves getting bored with each other, and what are we going to do? Am I going to be enough for you to want to be around when all this is done? I mentioned earlier, we've seen these escalating rates of divorce in China that you and I both read articles about. Um, this sense that, you know, people are having to come to terms with so much of uh, their inner, inner life space that is having to confront, what does it mean for those parts that I don't feel are enough to really be seen now even more fully? And so to the degree that people are isolated and disconnected, even though they are even like more proximate to people, I think is striking and one of the reasons why they're so anxious. Yeah, so it brings up this this longing and this awareness of our desire and need for connection, and yet the very presence of the relationship or the connection or the overpresence from what we're used to provokes anxiety and discontent. I want to let our listeners know that I'm going to post the link to the blog on uh, Kurt Thompson. Is it KurtThompsonMD.com? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. KurtThompsonMD.com will have the link posted to this blog that I'm referring to because it lists uh, 12 or 13 uh, practical steps. And we were talking before the conversation started and we hit record that what I appreciated about this blog is uh, we've probably all seen blogs or PDFs or some kind of social media that talks about, you know, here's five steps you can do or 10 steps you can do to stay healthy. And you listed some of those, but what was so helpful was that you laid out this foundation from some uh, overview theological issues to our need for connection to this interpersonal neurobiological aspect. And what really stood out is what you just said. And I want to restate just how important it is to, to realize this, that we talk a lot in our field about trauma and wounding and how that creates anxiety and how the nervous system gets dysregulated. But when I read this from you, I was like, oh, wow, that it just, a light came on. Mm. The greater anxiety far beyond trauma is the anxiety of abandonment. So that we're kind of created to be able to be resilient from trauma, but in the mm -hmm. absence of that connection, then mm -hmm. we're just fending for ourselves. And, and so the situation has us right now plunged into relationships, but the proximity, the intensity, the novelty, the boredom brings up the anxiety about, will this remain? Can I count on you? Will you be there? 
Right. So, that's, that's really well said. Yeah. Right. Can you just say more about that? How abandonment is that core anxiety and, and unpack a little bit about where that comes from uh, in the, in the biblical narrative. Well, my, I think my sense, Michael, is that, uh, I mean, a, a lot of my kind of anthropological understanding, if you will, of uh, the work that, that we do in neuroscience and psychotherapy, uh, healing of trauma, you know, comes out of the first three or four chapters of Genesis. And one of those things that we read in the second chapter is this comment from God that it's not good for man to be alone. And I think that it's not just a passing comment. It's not just a throwaway tagline. It is uh, a comment that has deep and lasting you know, implications for what that means for us as human beings. It's not good for any of us to be alone. And by to be alone, we mean not just can I be alone in my room, for in fact, I do need to be able to know that I can be alone. I can practice solitude in the presence of God in my own space. But that sense of existential terror that one might have, that, that I, mean, I mean, the simplest way to say this would be uh, human beings uh, take, you know, from the time that they're born, relatively, relative to our lifespan, take longer than any other animal to reach maturity. If you uh, have a cult that is born, literally within anywhere from five to 30 minutes, that cult is up and running. And if that cult did not have access to its mother's milk, it might not fend as well as it needs to be able to long-term, but the cult can move around. Uh, if a human being comes into the world and you leave it sitting on the stainless steel platform in which it's been wrapped up and you leave it there, it dies. Like we can't afford to leave each other alone and it begins right at birth for human beings. And it never ends. It never ends. And so this notion of it not being good for man to be alone then gets highlighted in Genesis 3, where tactically we see that one of the things that the serpent does in his conversation, uh, he has a, he doesn't, he hasn't, he, he waits to have a conversation with the woman alone. He does not invite anyone else into the conversation. Uh, there is a sense in which these are players that are going to be pitted against one another, the woman against the man, the woman and the man against God. This sense of isolation starts to show up, and then it reaches its culmination ultimately one chapter later with the murder of Abel by Cain, because Cain, of course, is also feeling so alone. Uh, as you and I have talked about on many occasions, I, th I think that shame plays a role in this. It's not the only thing that plays a role in this, but I think it's one of the major kind of interpersonal and neurobiological kind of affective, you know, emotional phenomenon that, that uh, kind of weighs in on this and that um, we use as a, as a leverage to make that happen. So I, I think that what we can end up doing, especially in our world where we have so much uh, stuff I have so much stuff that can um, help me, uh, help distract me from me, help distract me from the places where I walk around actually and probably have been walking around since I was a kid. Certain, certain rooms in my inner house, if you will, where if you walk in there, you would uh, see, you know, a four or 10 year old kid or like 13 or 14 year old guy who, uh, like, is not just alone in the room, but who is, like, really ruminating about really hard things and doesn't have any sense that there's any solution and has no sense that anybody's coming for him. So one of the things I, we, we talk about, and one of, the, one, one of the things we talk about a lot in our group work that we do is this notion of how important it is for us to bear in mind that nobody in the world under normal circumstances would not if if they were if 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 they were alone in the way we're talking about it, no one would not want somebody to be coming for them. Like we all want to know that the Marines are coming. Yeah. Yeah, we all want to know that uh, you're coming for me. And um, and and we're we we have all kinds of things that we can use to uh, paper mache over those parts of our life that, you know, deep in their caverns 
are worried that nobody's coming for me in that space. And our addictions are the way for us to cope with that and multiple other things. But I think that um, those, those old places that exist in each one of us, I think those are the things that this COVID-19 is uncovering. And, and so in that sense, this time becomes, uh, you know, e- evil might think that it's going to send this invading virus to undo the world. And I can imagine the Holy Trinity saying, oh, but they don't know that we're coming right behind it. Mm. In fact, we're right in the middle of it. And in fact, it's going to be a, something that opens the doorway for people to discover some of those things they've been hiding from. And when that door opens, we're going to be at the ready. I think about the work that you do with you know, your ministry, and I think that's what you do. You're at the ready. Uh, we were talking beforehand about how there are, you know, people who've been, you know, waiting for months, you know, for their opportunity to do this and how even with this, they're, they're not walking away. And, um, you know, it'll be a time, I think, for a lot of people to um, discover uh, opportunities for healing that they otherwise would never have imagined. I'm, I'm finding myself getting really uh, overwhelmed with emotion. Um, one of the things I love about you is how authentic you are, whether you're speaking or somewhere. And if people could, could see a screen, you know, you were really overcome in thinking about this Mm. idea of that, that someone's coming for us. Mm. And, um, I noticed in the news over the last couple of days, as the USS comfort came up the Hudson river or the East river, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I think Mm. it was the Hudson. And, um, they were shocked that people gathered around it and the, you know, they were breaking the, the, uh, the shelter in place and the distance mm-hmm. rules and things like that. And mm-hmm. at first I thought, well, of course they want to see this cool ship. And then I thought, no, people want to be around whether they need the rescue and the treatment or not. People want to be there because help is coming. Oh, there's no question. Yeah. That's, that's, that's right on. And I, I remember that's, that's during, right um, Hurricane Katrina, Bono and U2 released a song, The Saints Are Coming, with uh, Billy Armstrong from Green Day. And it was this, there were these clips of the tragedy and the flood and people on their roofs and, you know, grandmothers in rowboats. And I can't watch that without just losing it. And then the chorus goes, the saints are coming. The saints are coming Mm -hmm. as a playoff on New Orleans. And these jets come across the sky. And as you talked about mm. the Trinity saying, no, we're, we're right behind you. Mm. Um, there, there, there is yeah. this relentless pursuit, but also this theological word of prevenience. Mm-hmm. We know about providence, pro video, that God is over. But prevenience is, is a word we've lost, I think, that he's ahead right. of us. Yep. That he's yep. guiding us, that, that he's blazing the trail. And we're not alone. Right. We're not alone. And right. um, that, that primal idea that is someone coming for us in our alienation, in our place of needing rescue, in our place of confusion. And when you talk about just the concreteness of, yes, there's the illness and the COVID. Um, but I've heard so many people say, and this may sound ridiculous, but they're healthy people, you know, 30s, 40s. And they're like, well, I'm not worried about the infection or the virus. I'm worried about a paycheck and being able mm-hmm. to make my apartment payment. And um, it sounds so cliche. And yet it wells up something that I don't believe, but that I know. The mm-hmm. difference between mm-hmm. knowing and believing that, mm-hmm. that, uh, that love itself who has a name and his name is Jesus, that he's mm-hmm. present and that we're not alone. Right. Kurt, I want to read something that you wrote and then I'll stop talking and let you talk. You mm-hmm. said it's difficult for the brain to attune to others when it is afraid, but counterintuitively when we practice paying attention to others, our fear dissipates. Mm-hmm. Very counterintuitive. Unpack yeah. that. My imagination immediately goes to the movie, The Gray. The movie about men who crash in the great white north, airplane crashes. They were 
and who worked in the oil industry. Liam Neeson is the lead actor, and he's the oldest and most senior member of this team. They crashed the Great White North in the, uh, on, their, on their way to a vacation time. And the movie is the story of how they try to make their way to civilization while being hunted by a pack of wolves. And for those who haven't seen the movie, this is not gonna really give away much of anything because not everybody survives the crash. And one of the members of, who was on the plane, who's, who's, who's actually dying in the wake of the crash, in the immediate wake of the crash, Liam Neeson, who was, is, is with him, one of the most poignant moments for me in this is this young guy is dying and he knows he's dying and he's terrified. And the camera pans in on his face and he will look away from Neeson's character. He looks away to his right and to his left. And as soon as he looks away from his, to his right or to his left, he starts to panic and he will say, am I dying? I can't see, am I dying? And, and Neeson will, he just repeatedly over and over says, look at me, look at me, look at me. He won't answer his question, am I dying? He just says, look at me, I'm not leaving you. Look at me. And every time he looks at Neeson's character, everything about his facial expression becomes tranquil. I think th this, is a, this is a powerful example for me of some of your listeners, you're aware of the, the still face experiment uh, of uh, my, uh, uh, Ed Tronic. And um, this sense that when we see the gaze of another who's looking at us right here and now. Uh, I am brought to a place in which my middle prefrontal cortex, the front part of my brain, my thinking brain, is able to calm my brain stem, is able to calm my amygdala when I'm in the present moment. And one of the most powerful ways I can be in the present moment is if someone else gets my attention, if I am with you in this present moment. When I get anxious, my mind tends to wander away from my attunement to another person. When I am connecting to you in the here and now, and by connecting, I don't mean you and I are talking about COVID-19. Right. My, uh, I, I heard a story from a friend the other day who was standing in the supermarket in line, the checkout line, of course, everybody's six feet apart. So people, but there were two people at the end of the line who were just standing there. They weren't talking, but then they began to strike up a conversation. Now you can imagine if they're six feet apart uh, to hear each other, they have to talk loudly enough. So everybody around them is hearing this conversation start to happen. And the next thing you know, they start to talk about how the government should have done this. Leaders aren't doing this. It was one complaint after another. And before you know it, both of these people, were worked up into a froth, far more distressed and anxious than they were five minutes ago when they were just standing quietly with each other. Now, they were engaged with each other, but they weren't attuned to one another. They weren't paying attention to each other. They were paying attention to something that they were talking about, and that's different. Just talking with people for the sake of talking with people about something else is not the same thing as being connected to people about where they are and about what they're feeling and what they're sensing. So I can be anxious because my brain is worried about the future, but if I am connected to you in this present moment and not talking about something in the abstract, like COVID-19, like whether or not I'm going to keep my job, if I'm not doing this, if I'm, deaf, if I'm clearly connected to you, I'm actually creating a state of mind in which I am in the present moment. And anxiety requires that I be off in some future state in order for it to be active. Anxiety is about the future based on fears of the past, memories of the past. And as such, to the degree that I am actually able to be deeply present with you in this moment, I can't be anxious at the same time. And so for folks who are worried about being anxious, we say like, well, who are the two or three people that you're going to call today? And you are going to make sure that you are going to find out how they're doing. And in the course of that, you really want to ask them what they're feeling, what their emotional states are, not to solve their problem, not to just pile onto their worry, but to reflect that to them. And then also 
to be able to tell them what you're feeling, to be able to say, well, this has been hard for me. Not the world is coming to an end, but like it's hard right now, or I'm hopeful right now that I actually still do have a job and so forth and so on. So really you're saying um, that being very intentional about attuning with others as a way of practicing calmness and peace and being able to stay grounded as opposed to be anxious. Right. Right. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, part of what's challenging is um, if, as, as is the case, um, many of our listeners are now in their homes with the same people all day, every day. And so how do you continue to create new conversation? How do you continue to create novelty with the person that I'm having the same conversation with over and over and over again, all day, every day? And that indeed is challenging. It's difficult. But one of the things that we encourage people to do is to actually engage in creative activity together. The activity itself can become a bit of a mediator, if you will. So for instance, if we're going to play a board game, the board game itself is going to be something that can help. Uh, it gives us something new to talk about. It gives us something new to engage. If we are going to listen to a piece of worship music, if we are going to um, go online and like for some folks, they're going online and they're learning a new skill. They're learning how to cook in ways that they've never cooked before, but we're going to do this together. And so we now, I'm, I'm not j just going to go off and learn how to cook the meal by myself. I'm going to do it with my 12 year old, or I'm going to do it with my spouse or my friend or whoever I'm with as a way for that act of creativity to be the very thing that creates energy and novelty for us to have something infused into our relationship that we otherwise aren't going to have as easy, you know, we aren't going to have as easy, easy access to because we're not going off to our jobs or to our schools or to this or there with that information to bring home tonight over the dinner table. So I think that's where one of these, one of the challenges is that it does take extra energy for us to be thoughtful and creative about the new ways, the fresh ways that we will interact with each other on a moment to moment basis as these days unfold. I want you to unpack some of these uh, practical suggestions, but before we do that, I want to go back because something you said is so important. Um, you said that you can't be anxious in the present. And in the past, I've said and taught that it's impossible to be addicted if you're in the present moment because the addiction mm -hmm. is either about the future or the escape from the past. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people you know, with a spiritual approach or a Christian approach, they'll say, well, I just, I just need to, you know, trust God in this moment. And I think of uh, Brother Lawrence's book called Practicing the Presence of God, and mm -hmm. that, that it's, it's virtually impossible to experience peace, joy, connection, if you're in the future, or worrying about the future, or if you're in the past. And so mm -hmm. this idea of everything that we want and long for um, if we're with another person is available in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I just want you to come back and say that again in your words with, you know, the, the medical wisdom and authority and, and <laughs> everything there, just about mm. this idea that in the present is where we're connected, where we can uh, have that sense of it's okay. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things uh, that you are bringing up here is the reality that, uh, reflecting on what it means from a medical perspective, um, we way underestimate the role that our bodies play in our life. Now, at some level, you might say, well, no, I don't. I'm, I exercise. I do this. I do all these kinds of things. I'm paying attention to my body. But when it comes to anxiety, one of the things that we maybe not paying that much attention to is that the only way that I know that I'm anxious is because I'm embodied. It is my body that tells me that I'm anxious, but it is. And, and, and how does it do so? It tells me that by my, you know, muscle tension. It tells me by my heart rate. It tells me by my shallower respiratory, uh, you know, pulmonary function, so forth and so on. 
And so though, then when we, when we get anxious and we wonder, well, gosh, how can I fix that? The first thing I turn to is my thinking mind. Well, how can I think differently? How can like, and when you say, well, I just need to trust God. And you're like, oh, what the heck does that mean? Like, I don't even know what that means to trust God. Well, when we recognize that if anxiety, if anxiety is, is about future states where my mind wants to go, but it is primarily mediated by the body. One of the first things that we can do is recognize that my body is only, my, it only ever occupies the present moment. It's only ever like where I happen to be. My body sitting right here in Virginia is not in last Wednesday or next Sunday. It's here. The question is, can I invite my thinking brain, my reflecting brain, my sensing, imaging, feeling brain, can I invite it to join my body? And one of the ways that we can do that is by, first of all, you know, we, we've emphasized in this list of uh, practical applications, a practice of prayer, worship, of scripture study, is one way for us to direct the focus of our attention right here and now. But even before that, there are some meditative practices that we can enter into that engage our body first and foremost. So breathing exercises. We have a little thing we call a six breath per minute exercise. You literally breathe in and out six times a minute. The average adult respiratory rate for humans is about 12 to 15 per minute. If you're only going to breathe six times a minute, you obviously are going to have to change the way you breathe. And so we have people breathe intentionally, more deeply, more slowly, five seconds in, five seconds out, over 10 seconds. That's one cycle, six of those in a minute. What's important about that is that you can't do that while you're watching a video. You can't do that and listen to our podcast. You can't do that and read a book. And the reason that you can't is because if you start to pay attention to the podcast, You'll stop paying attention to your breathing and it will go right back to your normal respiratory rate. But if you're doing six breaths per minute, it's requiring your attentional mechanism that comes out of the right part of the front part of your brain. It requires your attention to exercise your attentional mechanism to pay attention to what you're doing with your breath right here and now. And if you are paying attention to that, a number of things happen at once. One is that you bring a certain sense of physical tranquility to your body. If you are breathing that slowly, you necessarily, your pulmonary function, your lungs become the tractor that pulls the rest of the body along with it. It slows your heart rate. It relaxes your, it relaxes your, uh, your body's muscle, muscle tension. It lowers your blood pressure. All those things, and then your brain's thinking tends to follow that. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm exercising my attentional muscle, which means that in this moment I'm more at peace, but I'm also doing something else. Because I'm exercising and doing this maybe two or three times a day, it means that at any other time during the day when I find myself becoming anxious and I pause and do that exercise for just 30 seconds. I am able to interrupt my thinking brain's tendency to go down the rabbit hole, off into the future, worried about what my job, the virus, the this, the that, or keeping it away from the regret of the past, why didn't I stock up on milk when I knew I should have? All these kinds of things that we can do. And so that embodied attunement to my, to my body and asking my body to do the work first and foremost, can become the engine that pulls everything else along with it. There are a number of other things that we can then do out of that state that only further strengthen our capacity to be less anxious over time. Would it be true then that as the body is attended to and then the mind kind of gets pulled along, that then the emotions fall in line and our, our choices, our behavior, our volition falls in line? And would you call that integration where everything starts to sync up? I, sh I certainly think that that's a, that, that's a useful way. You know, we, we, in our world of interpersonal neurobiology, the word integration has a particular meaning. And I think that, we're, that I mean, this would be a, a close approximation of that because I think uh, in integration for, you know, for us in, the, in our field of neuroscience is not just the coming together in a holistic way of my own mind. Um, it is also a coming together of my mind with your mind, because 
we, we assume that in order for me to be fully at peace over time, it's not going to mean that I'm going to just be okay within me. I'm going to have to be okay with you. I'm going to, and I need you in order for me to be fully okay over time, which is why one of the things that we do in our groups is that we have a number of these different embodied exercises that we have them do as a group right now. You know, people can have these exercises and they're like, okay, I can do that in the privacy of my own home or where nobody can see me, but like, heavens to Betsy, I'm not going to like do that where like other people might do it. And like, what if I'm the only one who closes my eyes and everybody else is watching me do this when Here's the interesting thing. Uh, if you're living at home with, uh, you know, uh, friends, siblings, spouses, whoever, um, if you were to um, do this six breath per minute exercise, for instance, together as a family for even five minutes, and then when you're done, just be curious with each other. Like, what do you feel in your body? What do you notice? The whole notion of doing this together as a community actually strengthens one's resolve, strengthens one's ability to do it as an individual. So we see that that integration process that you just mentioned, Michael, isn't just something that happens for me if I'm doing it. But if I'm doing it collectively with a small group of people, each of us, uh, each, each of our capacities for this integration is enhanced by the presence of us doing this work to integrate us even as a community. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it gets wired more deeply inside of us. All of those things falling in line within ourselves gets wired even more strongly and coherently mm -hmm. as we are attached to and experiencing that with another. Right. Right. So Kurt, on this list, which again, we're going to link to on this podcast, um, you talked about some of the things you just said, but there's also some things you said from a medical perspective to, for, that you encourage people not to do for their mm -hmm. own well-being. Can you talk about some mm -hmm. of those? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll just start. I mentioned earlier about our, our two grocery store patrons. Uh, one thing I would, I would suggest is that um, uh, when it comes to conversations with people, uh, I would, would highly recommend that we refrain from entering into conversations that are condemning or critical of things, because what that tends to do, it tends to ramp people up. It tends to take us away from being connected to each other and connected to things outside of ourselves, which in this time, we don't need any more of that kind of isolation that, that can take place, you know, even when I'm standing six feet away from somebody trying to talk with them. And so refraining from those kinds of conversations. Some basic things about just our physical um, activity. Number one, uh, we'll just talk with food, right? Um, I, like I've, I've noticed in my own house, like I am a huge mint Oreo fan. <laughs> and like Nabisco loves me over the last two weeks. I, I have to, you know, and so I will say to our listeners, please do, uh, you know, do what I say, not what I do. When it comes to food, it's easy for us to just graze. It's easy for us to become undisciplined because we're just around food, we're, 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 it can just happen. And so three meals a day um, and healthy snacks, that's one thing. Sleep, um, it's really important, I mean, for us to get good sleep. It's important for us, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that there are people who are now actually working even more hours than they were before, uh, and they're on screens all day. And so I will highlight this, that, you know, it's, it's been recommended and, and people, you know, kind of roll their eyes with me when I say this, the, the recommendation from uh, most groups is that it would be really healthy for our brains if we turn all screens off at least two hours before we go to bed at night. And, you know, most people would say, that, like, that's just, I'm just not having that. And so I usually say, okay, one hour, I'll just give you one hour. And so in the article, you'll see that I'm, I'm going to invite people to turn all your screens off at least one hour before you go to bed. That's going to facilitate your sleep cycle. Another thing about screens in general, and that is that it's okay to check your social media, um, but I would highly advise us not to be scrolling through it. If you find that you're on your media for more than uh, the amount of time that it takes to read one thing that you're interested in reading, um, it's time to get off. It's time to move on to something else. Because that will do two things it will tend to weaken your intentional 
your attentional capacity, number one. And number two, and, and so therefore make you more easily distracted. And if I'm more easily distractible, it will be far easy and I will be far more likely to go down the hole of anxiety. I'm just far more distracted toward anxiety than I am toward being at peace. I got to work for peace. Anxiety, it's easy as far as my brain is concerned. So refrain from scrolling. That's really an important thing to do. So we've talked about uh, food. We've talked about sleep exercise. Um, you know, fortunately, this didn't happen uh, in December, January. Uh, in my neighborhood, people are now able to get out and be about. One of the things I tell people is, you know, you don't have to go for long walks. But I would say if you were able to get out of your house two or three times a day and go for a five to 10 minute walk, that is as helpful for your brain as going for one long 45 minute walk and then coming into your house for the rest of the day. Being out multiple times for short bursts of activity does a couple of things for you. Number one, it moves your body, which your body's gonna feel better. But the other thing it's gonna do is, you know, anxiety, is a state in which we necessarily feel the lack of agency. If I'm anxious, I'm anxious because I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to do something, whether it's pass the test or keep my job or whatever. Internally, the sense is that I am not able to act on my behalf. Fundamentally, that begins with the body. Fundamentally, it begins with my deeply held sense of immobility. When I move the body and move the body frequently with purpose, not just pacing up and down my hallway, but with purpose, I'm going to go for this walk around this block this many times, I'm going to do it for 10 minutes, and I'm going to come back in the house. That kind of purposeful movement reminds the brain that the brain has agency. And in so doing, we're protecting the brain against anxiety states that it might be more inclined to travel toward. So those are some things, I think, just even from a kind of medical and physical standpoint that could be helpful for some of our listeners. Thank you. And would you comment on two more, um, the, the engaging in artistic and creative aspects? And then also, uh, you talked about keeping a journal, and interestingly, you said not just a gratitude journal, but a lament journal, and I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, I, thanks, for, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I, I think uh, we'll, we'll, we can talk about that, that last one that you mentioned first. Um, I think it's really important for us, uh, you know, we, we, it's very difficult for us to experience joy when my container is full of sadness. And in order for that sadness to be integrated into my life, not buried, not condemned, not gotten rid of, but healed, I have to name it. I have to name that this thing is actually happening. This is happening to me, for me, with me. But I have to name it in the presence of another. It's really important for me to name that with someone else. This is why we talk about the Psalms of Lament. These Psalms in the biblical, in the biblical uh, narrative of the Psalter, you know, they weren't written for individuals to go home and read by themselves. These were corporately sung and read in you know, poems. And in the presence of others where I am naming, this is really hard. And someone else says, you know, Michael, you're absolutely right. Like, this is really hard. And you know what? You're not stupid and you're not faithless because it's hard. You're not weak because it's hard. It's hard because it's really, really hard. For me to hear you validate and to be empathic with me about my sadness or my grief or my whatever it is, means that you yourself personally march into that part of my neurally encoded self, camp out, and I now have the sense that I am not by myself with that sadness, and it necessarily changes the nature of the sadness. But that is what lament is all about. Lament is my naming the things that have been hard. And so we want to keep a journal. I want people to take the time at the end of their day to write three things for which they're grateful. And it can't just be food, shelter, and clothing you know, and just repeat. 
I really want to think about like what was an event that happened today that I'm going to like I'm I'm going to work to pay attention to remember something of generosity like I was able to work online with a client that I haven't been able to work I'm going to name something three things that I'm grateful for but along with that I'm going to write my lament for the day mm. and you know we are uh we're really good at avoiding our junk right I'm going to be tough. I'm going to be, I'm going to be relevant. I'm going to be effective. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be the person that people can turn to. I'm not going to crack. Uh, that person is not going to last if that person does not name what is real about their life. And the reality is that we are people of great longing and desire. And we are people of grief. And a lot of life is lived right in between those two things, between desire and grief, with or without a COVID virus. And the lament that we learn about in scripture is the way that we sit in between those things, naming what is true about our life, both that we long for and that is hard and sad in the presence of another. In the article that I, I wrote, I invited the reader, when you do this, uh, one of the things I would invite you to do would be, you know, if you're going to be talking to somebody the next day or in the next couple of days, um, make it a practice to name, to, to have a person who you're going to share this with, that you're going to be able to say, this is my, this is my lament for yesterday. And don't take it lightly. Take it seriously. Our daughter is 29 and uh, she was to be married on May 9th. And that wedding's not happening. Mm -hmm. And it's a real grief. And, you know, one might say, you know, Kurt, um, there are worse things. It's not cancer. It's not COVID-19. It's not, and you know, it is, it's, it's true. And it would be easy for me to quickly, uh, go to all the things about my life that are good and right and whole things that I can be thankful for. Um, so as not to make it sound like the cancellation of a wedding of your 29 year old daughter is all that big a deal because, you know, it's not that big a deal compared to, you know, how many thousands of people have lost their loved ones because of this disease. And that would be a lie. And this is exactly what evil wants us to do. It wants us to minimize even the smallest of smallest of losses. Because if we can begin to minimize even the smallest of losses, eventually, if we practice that well enough, we'll eventually minimize everything. And if I'm carrying around with me those losses, pretending that they don't exist, they will end up taking up the space in my heart that I need to make available for God to love me, but he won't be able to because there will be too much grief there. And I will have all kinds of excuses by then to say, you know, God, you didn't show up for my daughter's wedding. You didn't show up for this. You didn't show up for that because it's just too painful for me to go there. And so, I think it's important for us to name those things that are hard in order for us to hear God say, I really get that. You're feeling that not because you're stupid, not because you're weak. You're feeling that because you're a human being and I made you. We're going to get through this, but this is hard. What's the next hard thing you got on your list? Yeah, I love it. That's so, so, so good. And it's hard and I get it and it matters, you know, no matter how small or no matter how big it matters. Mm -hmm. And what you just said there, I want to end on that, but it, it takes me right back to the grocery store where you said there were the two people and they started complaining. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think that lament is bitching or complaining, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if those same two people engaged over that level of, yeah, I'm really struggling. And mm -hmm. this has been hard mm -hmm. and it, it mm -hmm. really matters that there would have been the opposite effect. Exactly. There, there would have been more of a connection, even though they might have right. been strangers. Well, yeah, brother, this is, right. uh, this is so helpful to me. I want to go home tonight and, uh, mm. and start a lament journal. Mm. And uh, I, just, I just love you and I love your heart. Oh. And I love mm. how God has brought together your, your neuroscience mm. wisdom and uh, your medical practice and your care for people. And, you know, more than anything, as, as just a friend and brother, you are somebody who lives this and who walks 
this journey, you're not preaching something that you read in a book somewhere. So this has mm. been a blessing. Mm. Mm. And, and for me too, I, um, I've, I've been so grateful to um, have you uh, in my life and to be part of, I have, have had that um, opportunity to be part of the ministry that, that you do there. And I look forward to ongoing opportunity for that. You know, and, and these conversations, uh, I, you know, it's, it's funny when you, I, that the, the uh, essay went out and I think I'd, I'd sent you a link to it and you immediately wrote back and asked about if we could do this podcast. And like, dude, I'm, I'm saying like, like that was an example of Jesus coming for me. Mm. Um, even in your asking, you know, can we do this podcast together? And so, um, I'm just really grateful. Well, uh, two two grateful men as we yeah. try try to offer a little bit of hope out of our own brokenness and out of the mm. own mm. Our, our own um, glory and ruin side by <laughs> side. Right on. All right, right bless on. you. We'll talk again. Until next time. Thanks. So we've wrapped up another episode of Restoring the Soul. We want you to know that Restoring the Soul is so much more than a podcast. In fact, the heart of what we have done for nearly 20 years is intensive counseling. When you can't wait months or years to get out of the rut you're in, our intensive counseling programs in Colorado allow you to experience deep change in half-day blocks over two weeks. To learn more, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. That's RestoringTheSoul.com.